Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Psalm 119, verses 121 through 144. In verses 121 through 128, we see affirming your service to God. The psalmist breaks this up into three major sections. Cry to God for safety, count on God for action, and cling to God's word. First, count to God or cry to God for safety. Verses 121 through 123, beg for his help. In the first two verses there, the psalmist asks for the Lord to not leave him behind, to not abandon him to his oppressors, the ones who oppress him. This can refer to political, social, even financial oppression, such as the exploitation of a debtor by his loan shark. There's no relief in the company of wicked. Relief is only found in the Lord. And then there's this longing for God's word in verse 123. Have you ever stared really hard at something far, far away on the horizon? Maybe you're out hunting, you're staying absolutely still, eyes peeled for your prey. They begin to fail, to languish, to water up and lose strength. Here the psalmist's eyes are failing or languishing as he desperately reaches out for the salvation the Lord alone can provide. And as he searches the scriptures for relief. Then there's count on God for action, verses 124 through 126. Beg for his teaching, the first two verses in this section. The psalmist pleas for the Lord to teach the man his statutes, to teach him the word of God. And if the Lord indeed causes the psalmist to understand, then the psalmist fully expects to know God's testimonies, his word. And there's a longing for his victory, for the victory from the Lord. Verse 126, just as the psalmist begged the Lord to act, to do, to deal with his faithful servant according to God's loving character, so the psalmist now asks Yahweh to act in response to the enemies of the Lord, those who had broken God's law. And finally, there's a clinging to God's word in the last two verses of this stanza. Recognize its surpassing value. Verse 127, a bat living in a gold mine couldn't care less about the riches that surrounds him. He bypasses that gold each day in search of true sustenance, the food and water that he needs to live by. Same should be true of us. Our food and water should be found in knowing and obeying God's word. And verse 128, recognize its unshakable truth. The psalmist never twists God's word to say something other than what it says. And he never views the word of the Lord as being anything less than good and right and straight, perfectly true. Well, then we move to verses 129 through 136, growing in the grace of God. Again, uh, three major sections to this, having the right view of God's word, making the right requests of God himself, and responding the right way to God's enemies. Well, first, having the right view of God's word, verses 129 through 131, there's an acknowledging of Scripture's value in the first two verses here. Obedience to the Lord, our observance of his word, is directly related to the value that we place on those Scriptures. And then there's a longing for his word, verses 131. The psalmist yearns for the commandments of the Lord like a shipwrecked person longs so badly for a drink of water that they're tempted to drink the seawater that surrounds them. They're having to remind themselves of the danger of trusting the seawater, which will only do terrible harm to them. Long for the pure water, the living water, the word of God. Making the right requests of God himself in verses 132 through 133. There's appealing for grace in 132. Justice, remember, is getting what you deserve when you do wrong. Mercy is not getting what you deserve when you do wrong. Grace is getting something great even though you did wrong. It's unmerited favor. There's an appealing for grace and an appealing for holiness in 133. Complete reliance upon the Lord to make the psalmist sure-footed in the word of God to cause him to be obedient to the Lord, to be holy because God is holy. And finally, responding the right way to God's enemies, verses 134 through 136. There's a desiring of God's favor, once again, rephrasing of the psalmist's request for God's grace earlier in the stanza. And in the very last verse, there's a grieving over sin. True believers are marked by genuine sorrow over sin, whether their own or the sin of others. Not because of consequences. No, it's genuine sorrow because it's sin against our great God. And finally, our last stanza for today, verses 137 through 144, Beholding God's Righteousness. And there's a few sections to this as well. Range of God's righteousness, reflections of God's righteousness, and ripples of God's righteousness. The range of God's righteousness, verses 137 through 138, we see that God's character is righteous. 
course, that refers to anyone whose conduct is checked and found to be irreproachable, a person who is morally in the right. Job 34.10, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding, far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. He is righteous. But this also refers to God's justice, where he rewards the faithful, punishes the wicked, and helps the needy and oppressed. Nehemiah 9.33, However, you, God, are just in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. So God's character is righteous, and of course his actions are righteous as well. God's decision-making is right. It is straight. There's nothing crooked or twisted about his judgments. He's never wrong. He never makes mistakes. He never misleads, whether on accident or on purpose. God's judgments are always straight. They are always right because he himself is righteous. Well, then we get to reflections of God's righteousness in verses 139 through 141. How is this reflected? Well, we see in God's people, God's people are zealous. This is used here to describe in verse 139 the psalmist's religious fervor, his passionate devotion to the Lord. The idea that this fervor destroyed or consumed the psalmist, it's it's hyperbole to help us understand just how devastating it was for him to discover that those who presumably had been formerly allied with the Lord had forgotten God's word. And there's God's people love his word, verses 140 through 141. God's word is like a precious metal that has been so refined, it's absolutely flawless. Not even a microscopic speck of impurity lies within the scriptures. And in contrast to the traitorous evildoers who forgot God's word, the psalmist declares that though he is nothing to look at, though he is hated by his enemies, he endeavors to not forget the word of the Lord. And finally, ripples of God's righteousness. Verses 142 through 144, God's righteousness is everlasting. Contrast here the objective truth of God's word with the moral relativity we see in the world today. Every man or woman does what is right in their own eyes rather than obey the king, the Lord our God. But God's righteousness is everlasting. It never ends. And God's word is righteous. The last two verses of our stanza. God's word itself is righteous. Righteous forever because the Lord himself is righteous forever. These words in the Bible, never cease being righteous. They never cease being just. They never cease being right and true and straight and good. Justice is not found in the world. It can be sought, but it will not be obtained apart from the Lord's intervention in our lives and the right application of his holy word. Well, a major principle that we gather from these three stanzas today, God is totally trustworthy, and thus his word is trustworthy. The question is, are we trusting in the Lord when we read his word? Are you actively praying that he would illuminate scripture through his spirit so that you can understand and apply the great truths of the Bible to your life so that you can know God better and more intimately? We must worship him because he is awesome and his works are wondrous. We must praise God for he's so very great, so very good. I mean, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place on the cross, take God's wrath so those who repent from sin and believe in Jesus will not suffer his wrath forever in hell so we could serve and enjoy the Lord forever instead. Do you count on the Lord for action? Do you ask him to teach you his word each time you open the scriptures? Do you trust that he will help you understand his revealed will, how to apply his word to your own life? And are you content with the word of God, or do you find yourself longing for something more, something different, something new? If this is true, perhaps consideration here will will help. It's not politics that we need to understand. It's not the culture or whatever new ideas or new philosophies or new ways of looking at the world and mankind that our society brings about. That's not what we are to seek to understand. Ultimately, we need to get back to the basics. We need to saturate ourselves in God's word. We need to beg him, the Lord, for his spirit to illuminate his word so we can understand who God is, what he's done, also that we can love him more, fear him more, obey him to his glory, and we'll have the discernment when it comes to all these things in the culture, these ideas, philosophies, etc. throughout the world. Let's get back to the basics of the Bible. This has been Psalm 119 verses 121 through 144 and I hope you have a great day.